Hey there! So in the coming weeks, we're going to be trying out some new episode formats, including this one, which we're calling Secret Histories. Don't worry, the regular episodes aren't going anywhere. But please, let us know what you think, and I hope you like it. Video games about war are obviously very popular, and now war is becoming more like a video game. I mean, look at this controller for a remote weapon system. Look familiar? Well, what if I told you that the United States military played a huge role in the invention of video games? This all started back in the 50s, when there was this looming paranoia about the possibility of nuclear apocalypse. I mean, it was the beginning of the Cold War, and the world was a much less fun place to live in. There were nuclear sirens going off everywhere, there were even cartoons about being killed by nuclear bombs. What are you supposed to do when you see the flash? <laughs> Worse, there weren't any fun video games to play. The only computers were these huge mainframes that cost a million dollars and only existed at elite research facilities. They were mostly used for crunching numbers for the US military. Like say, I don't know, calculating the trajectory of a ballistic missile. So it's weird then that out of this dead serious environment, video games were born. Tennis for Two, the very first American video game outside of OXO, which doesn't really count because it's basically tic-tac-toe, was developed on military equipment. It was invented by William Higginbotham, a prim and proper 48-year-old physicist who had previously worked on the development of the atomic bomb, and later became a leading non-proliferation advocate. While assigned to Brookhaven National Laboratory, a base that pioneered nuclear weapons, he noticed that visitors to the lab often were kind of bored. So he had this great idea. What if he repurposed a Donner Model 30 analog computer to play a game? The Donner was this hulking 28-pound metal box with a voltage meter out front instead of keys, it worked by plugging in wires into different holes. But sure enough, it worked. Tennis for Two was a hit. On October 18, 1958, hundreds of visitors lined up in front of the lab in Upton, New York, which at the time was filled with all these crazy machines like something you'd see in an H.G. Wells novel. These visitors had one goal and one goal alone, to hit a tiny blue ball back and forth across the screen of an oscilloscope. The crazy thing is that Higginbotham used his experience as a researcher at the radiation lab at MIT to create Tennis for Two. So what that means is that one of the earliest video games on record would not exist if the military hadn't been dumping so much money into weapons of mass destruction. Okay, fast forward to 1961. Patsy Cline's Fall to Pieces is on the radio, The Pony is the hot new dance move, and a group of students created a game called Space War. Perhaps unsurprising for a game about two spaceships shooting each other, Space War was developed at MIT's Lincoln Lab, which was another military R&D center which was chartered specifically to defend the nation from air attacks. There, these MIT students had access to the enormous PDP-1, a computer that was designed by two former students of the lab. The first PDP-1 was sold to the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory in California, which, surprise, surprise, was a pioneer in the research of nuclear weapons. Fire. But Space War was a huge hit, as students quietly passed copies of the code to each other in the hallways. The computer scientist Alan Kay told Rolling Stone in the early 70s, Space War blossoms spontaneously wherever there is a graphics display connected to a computer. It's important to remember that the kinds of people who are making and then later playing games like Space War were not future five-star generals. They're basically hippies. They're people like Nolan Bushnell, whose first act after founding Atari was to create a Space War knockoff called Computer Space. I know, very creative. Atari was a place where, in Bushnell's own words, pot smoke filled the air and hippies skated between arcade machines. Bushnell wanted Atari to be an extension of San Francisco's popular Haight-Ashbury neighborhood that was just up the street. So games owe a lot to long-haired, liberal-minded people advancing new ideas on machines entirely funded by the U.S. military. Next, let's set the time machine for 1966, the year that the first video game console was developed. It was originally a prototype called the brown box because it was a brown box. It was invented by Ralph Baer, a Jewish American immigrant who fled Germany with his parents just before the Holocaust. Baer found himself working at a company called Sanders Associates. And surprise, surprise, Sanders Associates was a defense contractor who specialized in aircraft defense systems and was later acquired by Boeing. When Baer wasn't creating tools to snoop on the Soviets or designing Saturn V launch equipment for the space race, he was using military-funded technology to bring video games to the masses. The brown box prototype eventually became the Magnavox Odyssey, and video games became the flourishing industry that we know and love today. Just dance? Like, why do you think I would want to play this? As for the military, well, 
they changed courses. They looked around and said, hey, maybe we can take advantage of all these amazing games that we've been inadvertently funding. One of the earliest instances is the 1980 tank game Battlezone. The game was so realistic for the time that the army approached Atari, who made Battlezone, about creating a new version called the Bradley Trainer, which would teach gunners how to blow up other tanks without the high cost of blowing up other tanks. The action's so real, you just might forget it's a game. Battle zone. Some of the folks at Atari hated the idea of working on a game like the Bradley Trainer so much that they just refused to work on it. Nonetheless, this marked a turning point. Games would push the military to new places, not the other way around. In the early 80s, DARPA began experimenting with video games as a form of combat simulation, resulting in something called SimNet, which allowed fledgling pilots to try their hand at flying a helicopter or an airplane. Then in 2002, America's Army was released as a recruitment tool, and it uses the same technology that powers games like Gears of War. And then finally, last year, in a pull quote that makes me weep for humanity, a drone pilot told the guard that drone strikes were a lot like playing a video game. So what began as free spirits turning war machines into peacetime playthings has come full circle. Peter Singer, the former director of the Brookings Intelligence Center, said that games like Call of Duty inspire combat and set the expectations for what future wars might look like. You might say, it's advanced warfare. But the reality is, is that there's always been a tug of war between ingenuity and combat. The military's had an active hand in microwaves, semiconductors, the internet, and, well, video games. So there you have it. I hope I didn't bum you out too much, but that's the secret history of the military and video games. So what do you think? Now that you know about the historical connection between the military and video games, will that force you to think differently the next time you pick up that military shooter? And hey, I didn't even get a chance to talk about the licensing of military weapons in video games or virtual reality. Palmer Lucky, the guy who created the Oculus Rift, got his start working on virtual reality at a lab that was funded by the US Army. Hash it out in the comments, and if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Last week, we talked about whether or not the popularity of Minecraft goes hand in hand with the rise of overbearing parents. Let's see what you had to say. Saurus Blood, who's studying to become a child educator, says that Minecraft can serve as a useful proxy for educators uh, in that if they wanna show their kids something dangerous, they don't actually have to put them in harm's way. They can just do it in Minecraft. I actually had a teacher in, uh, in college who during a chemistry class was demonstrating some kind of, I don't know, explosive reaction and exploded a trash can, put a hole in the roof. Yeah, he doesn't do that anymore. James Byrne says that Minecraft is unstructured play, which is good, but it's at the expense of physical activity. So here's the thing. I don't necessarily think that video games and physical activity are a zero sum proposition. What I mean by that is every hour that you put into Minecraft, yes, maybe that's not time spent outside, but that's no less true than an hour spent, I don't know, playing an instrument or an hour watching a really amazing television show or I don't know, having dinner with your folks. Those things are not physical in their nature, but we deem them to be important for adolescent development because they do lots of wonderful things. Ultimately, it's up to parents to manage that balance. So I'm not saying that kids shouldn't go outside and do amazing things and they should play Minecraft instead. I'm just saying that maybe we should augment that and uh, appreciate the things that Minecraft does do for kids. Joseph Guy says that Minecraft is important for a couple of reasons. One, because it's uh, Joseph Crap, Crap, yes. Oh. Joseph Guy says that Minecraft is important for a couple reasons. First of all, because of its cosmopolitanism, is that it's a game that can be played by people all around the world. And I think that's something really special about Minecraft that you don't necessarily need language necessarily to be able to communicate with other people or to build something. Um, you can kind of just do it together. So in that sense, yeah, Minecraft is a complete equalizer. But there's something else that you said, which I thought was really interesting, which is that people are building companies, businesses around different elements of Minecraft. So whether that's monetizing through doing Let's Play videos on YouTube or creating skins for people that they sell. Um, one of the interesting things that I think about games, and this is something that Gabe Newell at, at Valve had pointed out, is that there's this potential for games to be these user-generated economies, and Minecraft is a great, great example of that. It's so omnipresent that in and of itself, aside from the sale of the game, it's creating revenue for all these different people around the world. So yeah, those are both great reasons for why Minecraft is also important. Rick Hamilton actually was interested in the addictive qualities of Minecraft, which is a common complaint from parents. They often use those terms. Minecraft is addicting for my kids. And he says there's no such thing as gaming addiction, only gaming compulsion. First of all, I think you should watch my episode on addiction. And second of all, I think addiction is absolutely a real thing. I mean, 
people get addicted to all types of stuff. There's a you know now a center in Minneapolis that treats people for gaming addiction, and HBO just published a documentary called Love Child about uh, about two parents who actually lose their child because they spend too much time playing World of Warcraft. So I think these are real, real problems. I think we should call them that because being able to name something gives uh, us as a society better tools to treat it. The name nerd weeps for kids with overprotective parents who won't let them play Minecraft because of, you know, zombies. Here's the thing. I understand from a parent's perspective, you know your kids best, you know what they can handle. If you need to make that decision to not let them play games, then yeah, that's totally, totally your call. In fact, I have personal experience with this. When I was a kid, my parents would not let me play video games because I had a complete emotional breakdown playing Contra. I just like couldn't share with other kids. Um, so my parents decided all throughout my childhood, no video games, no video game consoles. I missed out on Nintendo and Sega, et cetera, et cetera. So you might say that this show is kind of you know, like a big middle finger to my parents, huh? Love you, Mom.